I'm super excited to be here to tell you about New Horizons, but also to be at first championships. I'm ready for some stronghold. How about you guys? So today, I'm going to tell you about NASA's New Horizons mission to Pluto. I'm a deputy project scientist on that mission. And as you see through the talk, there's some similarities between New Horizons, the spacecraft, and the first robots that you guys are working on. So I'm also a first mentor. I've been an uh, FLO coach, and I'm a mentor for Team 1619 Upper Creek Robotics from Longmont, Colorado. All right. So I'm going to tell you about. I'll, I'll let you guys know when to put the 3D glasses on. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the spacecraft mission, why we went there. Then we'll, I'll show you some results from Pluto, including 3D. And there will even be a point in the talk where you'll get to decide which, what you want to hear about, a little audience selection for you. So this was our best view of Pluto about a year ago. This image was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see, we can almost tell nothing about it. I'm a ground-based astronomer, and that means I like to go to telescopes and look at things and learn about the surface. Well, we had really exhausted what we could learn from these sort of pixelated images. So what we needed to do was to build a spacecraft. So much like in first robotics, we designed the spacecraft, we built the spacecraft, and I will say, we had more than six weeks, so. <laughs> it was actually a pretty short build cycle for an interplanetary spacecraft. It was a little less than four years, but much better than six weeks. So we built it, and then we tested it. And we tested it, and we tested it. And we made lots of contingency plans. Because we were going to launch the spacecraft, and there's no way you can't send out you know, your pit crew team to fix it. Once it's launched, it's gone. So that's one way that this is very different from first. You guys have got wrenches on the robots today, and you will have a weekend if something goes wrong. You swap it up, you fix it. On an interplanetary spacecraft, you don't have that option. You have to make sure it's going to work. And that's critical. So we tested it. This was our spin test. So you build this expensive spacecraft, and then you want to spin stabilize it. And so you need to make sure that the moment of inertia is right, and it's not wobbling. So you put it on a spin table and spin it. So that's what this test is. And then we launched it. We launched it January 19, 2006. So looking out at the audience, I see there's probably a lot of FRC kids out there. You guys were quite young. You were probably in elementary school when we launched this. And it was launched a really long time ago, but I'm here today to tell you about new results because it's a very far journey across the solar system to get to Pluto. Pluto is more than 30 times further away from the sun than the Earth is. So what we had done was we built a relatively small spacecraft. The spacecraft is about the size of a grand piano. And then we launched it on the largest rocket we could get. It's an Atlas V 551. And on that rocket, big rocket, small spacecraft, what you get is the fastest object ever to leave Earth. It was flying at about 34,000 miles per hour. Now you think about it, it's really hard to put, wrap your head around that number. The way, one way I like to think about it is, back when the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, it took about three years, or three, sorry, three days for the astronauts to get to the moon. New Horizons passed the orbit of the moon in just nine hours. So we were flying by. And we got to Jupiter just 13 months later. And yet it took nine and a half years to get to Pluto. So that really helps set the scale of the outer solar system. But things don't always go perfect. You probably find that in FRC too. Something breaks, something goes wrong. So what happened, I wanted to tell you a little story, because this story was from the 4th of July last summer. And it reminded me of when your robot loses connection with the FMS.
because that's basically what happened to us. We didn't lose contact with the field management system. What we lost contact with was the deep space network. We had an anomaly on the spacecraft. That's like a big problem. What happened was, it was the 4th of July, last summer, we were approaching Pluto. We were working every day, seven days a week, because I was like a kid in a candy shop. Every day there was a new image of Pluto. We were getting closer and closer, and we were finding out new things about Pluto and its moons that we had never known before. It was amazing. But we had really been doing that for about a month. So, 4th of July was going to be an easy day on the spacecraft. We were going to make a trajectory correction maneuver. Everything was going so well, we decided we didn't need it. So, a bunch of us took a day off. Never take a day off. <laughs> because what happened was the spacecraft went safe. Now, we call it a go safe. And when you go safe, that sounds like a good thing. It's actually really bad. That means it had a problem. We were talking to the deep space network. Here's a picture of an antenna there. They're 70 meters across. So think a good chunk of a football field, these antennas. And we're talking to the antennas, sending data back down, <coughs> and all of a sudden, the spacecraft goes silent. And we have no idea what happened. I get a call from the mission operations manager. We all rush to the applied physics lab in Maryland, where our mission operations center is. I was located in Maryland at the time. And we all got together in the situation room. When I got the call, I was feeling really sick to my stomach. But as I settled into the situation room with the team I had been working with for 10 years, we all knew what to do. Just like if something goes wrong on your robot this weekend, you guys have been working together hard and know what to do. So we sat down in the situation room. Everybody had their job. We found out what happened. But the problem is that it takes a really long time to communicate out 30 astronomical units. Remember, it's 30 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun to get to Pluto. In fact, it takes nine hours to send a signal out there. So that's like if I say hi to you, and then I go watch three football games, and I come back and hear you say hi back to me. That's what the conversation is like. So it took us three days to get the spacecraft back in a regular state. And what had happened was we were taking this great data of Pluto, and we have to compress it on the spacecraft to save it to be downlinked. And we were also uplinking a command load um, so that it could take off and do what it needed to do for the, the next time period. And it overtaxed the computer. Now, you remember, this spacecraft had been flying for nine and a half years. So this computer is like 11 years old. Any of you guys using an 11-year-old computer for your drive, drive system? So I saw one person using it, but not for anything probably mission critical. Because it just it's hard to trust that old computer. Fortunately, we planned for it with two computers on board. We were able to get our spacecraft back up and running in three days, which was the time period that was really critical. Because just like you guys have autonomous mode, we had a special autonomous mode. And it was going to kick off on that third day. So we had to have the spacecraft ready to go. And in our special autonomous mode, if the spacecraft had a problem, it would try and diagnose it itself and then bring it back up. And here's why. This is an animation of what the spacecraft would be doing. This is not in real time. This is uh, sped up by, I think, a factor of four and you, or more. And you can see the space, actually it's well more than four. You can see the spacecraft going through its motions, pointing at the different objects with the different cameras on, the on board because we wanted to collect as much information as we could about Pluto as we flew past. We don't have the technology right now to be able to stop and orbit Pluto. So the best we could do was fly by. And we had to make sure that we got the best information we could as we did that. Now you remember, the reason we want to do that is because this was our best view of Pluto before. And now, we have this view. I never get tired of looking at this image of Pluto. There's 
so much detail in here that we had no idea about. I had been staring through ground-based telescopes for years, and it always looked like this. There's this large heart-shaped region in the middle of Pluto. Now, through the ground-based telescopes, I could tell that Pluto was brighter in this hemisphere, but I had no idea why. And I knew from spectroscopic measurements that Pluto had carbon monoxide ice preferentially on this side. And now, today, we know that's because that large uh, heart-shaped region, especially um, the left side of it, is a glacier. And so that is a glacier, but it's not a glacier made out of water ice. Pluto is very cold. It's 40 degrees Kelvin, so it's almost absolute zero. The ices that are mobile in Pluto are nitrogen ice, methane ice, and carbon monoxide ice. These are things that are gases um, on Earth because it's so warm. But if you lower the temperature, the Pluto temperature, they become ices. And so there's so that's what that large region is. And we didn't know that until just this past summer. Now I'm going to show you some of my favorite sites on Pluto. So this, I'm going to zoom in on that yellow box um, at the edge of the glacier. And we informally call the glacier Sputnik Planum. So this is what the margin looks like right between the, the glacier and the rough terrain above it. We now know that there's a large change in elevation. So those, that rough terrain is kind of like a cliff overlooking the glacier, which is down lower. And you can see flow lines where the nitrogen ices that are flowing around the obstacles. And you can see those things that are labeled polygonal cells. Those are, we believe those are convection cells. So um, we think that it's warmer underneath the ice, which makes sense, you have pressure to warm things up, and then that, that you're having convection um, that's moving material from down lower up higher. And so that's what those convection cells, those, that kind of cellular terrain is. This is another zoom in on a certain area right at the edge of Sputnik Planum. And what you see here are um, glaciers. You see, um, ice is flowing from the higher area, the rougher, higher area, down into the lower area, and it's dragging along part of that rougher area. That's what makes those hill chains and clusters that you can see labeled in the image. There's also mountains on Pluto. We had no idea if Pluto would be able to support significant topography, and yet there's mountains. And you see the pointed, pointy kind of mountains here, up in the image. And those mountains we call the Norgay Mountains, in honor of Tenzing Norgay. We also have the Hillary Mountains, um, in honor of the two people who summited Mount Everest and first. And those mountains, the Norgay Mountains, are about as tall as the Rocky Mountains. And so that's pretty amazing when you think about it. There's these large mountains, and we believe that those are made out of water ice. At the temperatures of Pluto, water ice behaves more like a rock. And so unlike the silica rocks that we have here, you have water ice structures. And then down a little bit lower, below those pointy mountains, there's this kind of round feature with a dark area in the middle. And we believe that that's potentially a cryovolcano, so an ice volcano. We didn't see anything erupt from this volcano, but due to the texturing on the terrain and the age of that surface, there's only one crater in that whole area indicating that it's relatively young. We think that this is pretty good evidence that this is of volcanic origin, so materials coming up from the deep interior and then layering out on the edges. <coughs> This is another mountainous region, and I'm going to zoom in on the yellow box. And you can see it almost looks like that those mountains, those <coughs> large blocks, have separated from the shore. You can especially see it near the upper region where it looks like there's kind of, they may have disconnected and then flowed into the glacier a little bit. And we have really high resolution images of this as well. 
This image is about 380 meters per pixel. And I'm going to zoom in near the top of that, right at the margin between those blocks and the glacier. And that's what you see. This is about 70 meters per pixel. This is like our, one of our highest resolution images. And you can see there's amazing detail in this image. You can see layering in those blocks, different colors. You can see where the blocks meet the margin of the, the glacier. You can see details in the glacier form on the surface where the ices are sublimating. That means they're going from a solid phase into a gaseous phase. Because Pluto also has an atmosphere, and it's the sublimation of those ices that supports their atmosphere, its atmosphere. And this is one of my favorite features. It looks like a small lake. This is also a very high resolution image. It's about 70 meters per pixel. And this uh, thing that looks kind of like a frozen lake is probably about 10 kilometers across. And it's interesting to me because we wouldn't expect to have fully liquefied material on Pluto. And so this can set maybe in the past and that the pressure would have been higher in Pluto's atmosphere. We have evidence of variation in Pluto's atmospheric pressure, which could actually allow liquids to be on the surface. And when I'm talking liquids, I don't mean water once again, I'm talking about nitrogen. And so that's kind of an interesting feature that we're still learning about. Now it's time for the 3D time. So put on your 3D glasses. Be sure to have your, the red lens on the left side. And we'll go around. I think the 3D is going to work better on the two end screens where the colors are a little uh, stronger. So this is a 3D image. In each of the 3D images, there's a context image up in the upper right, and there's a yellow square so that you can see what you're looking at. And so what you can see, hopefully, is that the rougher terrain is higher elevation than the glacier. And you can see craters there pretty strongly. I'm just going to put on my glasses so I can walk you through it. And then moving around Sputnik Planum, you can see um, it looks like the, the older terrain, not the, the glacier, that's a newer area, but meaning it gets resurfaced more often. That older area has just bombard, been bombarded by craters and broken up and has interesting features. This is that mountainous region that I showed you with the blocks. And I'm going to zoom in on that. 3D. You can see that. So this one I really like because you get so much more information out of the 3D too. You can see how tall those blocks are. And the interstitial material, the material in between is down quite low. And then the, the margin to the left of it is depressed. So it seems like there's an area that's low next to those blocks, which is partly why we believe that perhaps this has all uh, been disconnected from the rough terrain and is moving forward. We also have compositional information that supports that hypothesis. And these are the mountains that I was telling you about. And you can see that really the Cryovolcano is quite tall as well. It's harder to tell that in the, the non 3D image. And this one's kind of one of my favorite 3D images. This is an area we call the bladed terrain because we don't have any analog to talk about it uh, on Earth. This is linear ridges that are many miles long and they're aligned north south and they're several hundred feet tall and maybe separated by a mile or two. And it's just ridge after ridge after ridge. This area is made up heavily of methane ice. And one hypothesis is that it's been sculpted by interaction with sunlight. And there's very small scale features like this you can find in the Arctic and the ices, but nothing at all on the scale. 
And then I like this image as well. It shows that dark area. We call that Cthulhu Regio, once again, an informal name. But you can see how heavily cratered it is. Crater after crater just overlaying each other. That indicates that it's a very old area. And uh, when we look at it in the infrared, we, it looks like it's been very highly processed. So it's been there over a long time, um, exposed to ultraviolet radiation and cosmic rays. This is a crater. So there's kind of a large crater in the middle there with multiple small craters inside of it. It's amazing how much you can learn from craters. You can learn about the subsurface. You can learn about the properties of the surface. You can learn about the age of the surface. And so we can learn a lot by looking at uh, this crater. This crater also is named after Venetia Burney, who was a little girl back in 1930. She was like 10 years old. And she's the person who came up with the name Pluto for Pluto back, back way in the day. And this area here you see in the yellow square is interesting because it shows um, a variety of craters. You can see large craters with central peaks, craters with ice, the, the bright material is ice at the bottom. But then you also see craters with dark material at the bottom. You can see extensional features telling us about the tectonics that happened on Pluto in the past. And there's a, a crater um, about half, a little more than halfway up on the right side with ice in it. I think that one's really interesting because I believe what that's telling us is that that glacial ice actually had a further extent previously and it's, it's receding in that area. And then the kind of cool eye-looking crater, the one with the ice and then a central peak that's kind of the most prominent crater here in the image, uh, that's one of my favorites as well. We named it after my thesis advisor, Jim Elliott. So. All right, <laughs> we're on to the audience selection part, so you don't need the 3D glasses anymore. But I do not feel qualified to talk about either a Sally Port or a drawbridge. So I'm going to change it up a little. So if you want to hear, clap, shout, whatever you want. If you want to hear about Pluto's moons, go ahead and clap. small. And 
So that's part of it. But then also, we didn't see a strong signature of the atmosphere on approach. Remember those images? There was no smear from an atmosphere. We didn't, I didn't point out clouds or planet A's. So that tells you that it doesn't scatter back very much, but it scatters forward. And so that tells us that the particles have to be larger. And how do you reconcile those two? And we've been in modeling this a lot. And what we find is that the best model we have so far is a fractal aggregate. So if you have small, like tenth of a micron particles that are conglomerated together into a one micron size particle, that can explain this haze. And that's something brand new. We didn't even know a year ago. So that's pretty neat about the atmosphere. And this image always takes my breath away. It has everything. It's got glacier, mountains, but I'd love to see the layers in the atmosphere in this image. This image also is one of my favorites. It was taken just 15 minutes after closest approach. And the spacecraft was moving very quickly by. It was going at 14 kilometers per second, so it's very fast. And we were concerned this one might, this image might be smeared, so we had to take lots of precautions in how we scan the spacecraft to make sure it wasn't smeared. So it took a lot of technical work on the side of the engineers and the scientists to plan this just right. And we weren't sure it was going to work because we couldn't practice. When we, we didn't have, we had Jupiter, but we flew much further, by much further, so we didn't have this exact situation. And this image was coming down early on a Sunday morning, like 6 a.m. And I woke up and I pulled it up on my screen and it looked just like this. There's been no processing. This is, it was unsmeared. So this was a real testament to the hard work of the team to make this all come out. But I show it here so you can see all the different layers in the haze because that's just astounding. And this is telling us a lot about the dynamics in the atmosphere. And we're not even sure of the whole story yet. We're still working on it. We also did what's called stellar occultations, where you watch the sun set behind Pluto from the spacecraft. This is an animation showing that. And we watch that in the ultraviolet spectroscopically by spreading out all the wavelengths of light. And this allowed us to um, understand the composition as a function of altitude in the atmosphere. We also did the same experiment sending radio signals from the Deep Space Network. Remember I told you about the Deep Space Network earlier? We sent signals through Pluto's atmosphere as the spacecraft was setting behind it. And we were able to learn about the temperature and pressure at the deepest at parts of Pluto's atmosphere. And these are the initial results from that experiment. You can see the pressure versus altitude and the temperature versus altitude from when the Earth set behind Pluto and then came back up the other side. And we, don't, we didn't have any other way of probing this without the spacecraft. You couldn't get this measurement from the ground. And so we now know that Pluto's atmospheric pressure at the surface is about 10 microbars. We, and so that's pretty cool. That's a new result. And you can see the, the temperature profile of the atmosphere as well. So what's next for New Horizons? We passed by Pluto. And as I said, we didn't have the capability to stop in orbit. So we flew by, and we just kept going. We still haven't transmitted all the data. It won't be until about October before we get all the data back. And, um, but we wrote an extended mission proposal to NASA, because that's how these things work. So we said, NASA, we would like to fly by this other object. And it doesn't have a really good name yet. It's called 2014 MU69. We're hoping to get a better name soon. And we're going to fly past it on January 1st, 2019. And the proposal is to let us, to do, let us uh, support building command loads for the spacecraft and doing science so that we can learn about this small object. This is a really interesting object. It's only about 45 kilometers across, so it's a lot smaller than Pluto, but it's a remnant of early solar system formation. And so it's going to tell us some very important things about how our solar system was formed. And so I'll leave it here with my favorite image.
information imagery to come down early, but we have a lot of uh, spectroscopic information that tells us about the composition of Pluto's satellites and the other side of Pluto, and some of that data still needs to come down. So that's going to be coming down uh, soon. So are cryovolcanoes found on other planets? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, so there's geysers that were seen on Triton, and Triton is a moon of Neptune. And it's about the same size as Pluto, and it, has, it inhabits kind of a similar part of the solar system. And so those geysers didn't have that kind of same structure, but when the Voyager spacecraft flew by in 1989, you could actually see a plume rising out of some geysers, and then um, there was a shear layer in the atmosphere, so you could see the plume go that way. So that's probably the closest of what we've actually seen previously. So the question is, why didn't we build another telescope instead of sending another probe? Uh, yeah, so there was no way that we could build a, a better teles a telescope that would give us anything near this resolution. So um, the Hubble Space Telescope is a great telescope, but you can see the image that it returned with Pluto. There's the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to be really awesome when that flies, but it, it'll tell us different information. It won't give us anywhere near this kind of detail. So we really just don't have the capability of building a telescope that can, can do this.
to see one of these Kuiper Belt objects. Voyager went through this area, but uh, didn't know, wasn't close enough to any to look. We didn't know, frankly, at the time to look. So, okay, another question. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, background radiation. So, um, let's see. You get cosmic radiation from outside the solar system of Pluto to a fair amount. So, you're going to have processing of the ices even on the dark side. So, it's not just from the sun. But from an engineering perspective, we're flying uh, an RTG, which is a radioisotope thermonuclear um, generator, which allows the decay of plutonium produces heat, and that heat gets turned into energy, and that's our power source. And so there's also radiation on the spacecraft, so if you mean that as well, we had to consider that as a design, engineering design challenge. So there wasn't, there's not that much interesting on radiation around Pluto, but we looked at the plasma field, so the solar wind and its interaction with Pluto's atmosphere, that was one of our science goals, and so we've been working on understanding that. We have two instruments, one called SWAP and the other called Pepsi, that, um, under, that are in situ instruments, so they measure the plasma field as, as they interact with it. Okay. Any information on Eris? Oh, Karen, yes. Um, so we got lots of information on Karen. I'm wondering if I can go back, I can show you something. It's a good way to get to the Pluto moon part. Okay, so this is Pluto's large moon, Charon. It's interesting because Charon is about half the size of Pluto. And so it's a pretty substantial world in and of itself. And it surprised us. It has this dark red area at the top. And um, we just submitted a paper about what that, that might be. So we, that's been kind of an interesting study as to what what can make that dark red area. But one of the interesting things is that tectonic belt, you can see a large canyon going across a large part of Pluto. At first we called it the tectonic belt, and then someone on the team suggested it should be called the tectonic sash, because it kind of goes all the way across. And that's four times as long as the Grand Canyon and twice as wide in some parts. And you can see the greenish, reddish image, that's a digital elevation map. You can see the, the um, scale bar on the side. So some of those peaks are about seven miles, maybe six miles high or seven miles high compared to the lower surface area of that canyon. And there's this um, kind of relatively smoothish terrain that seems to be kind of a thin lithosphere. So the top part of the surface is thin. And you can see up in the top corner of that image, it looks like there's a, a mountain-like structure, it's pretty significant in size, but it's sunk into Karen's surface. So those are some uh, highlights of, of Karen, and, and it's really quite amazing that we've been able to get all this information. Uh, I go back to spending years on ground-based telescopes. Pluto and Karen are very, very close together in the sky, so unless the air is very smooth, you can't, and you're in a big telescope, you can't even separate Pluto from Karen often. And so now we have these amazing images. Um, I'm not sure, I'm going to check the time. Okay, uh, good, I have time for more questions. So. Oh, over there, okay, I just can't see back there, sorry, go ahead. Uh, losing its atmosphere, is that the question? Yes. Yeah. So actually, Pluto is expected to lose its atmosphere, and so we had models of how much Pluto was losing its atmosphere of, uh, by, and one of the objectives of the spacecraft program was to go measure how much atmospheric uh, mass Pluto was losing, its interaction with the solar wind. And interestingly, it, it, Pluto is losing uh, mass in its atmosphere, but not as much as we expected. And we found that it's not as much as we expected because the upper atmosphere of Pluto is uh, colder than we had expected. 
And so that binds it a little bit closer to the surface. Question? Yes. Uh, so my question is, uh, you guys are mostly receiving images back. So can you walk us through how exactly do you guys go about analyzing them to come up with your conclusions? Yeah, sure. So we get a lot of images back, and how do we go about analyzing them? So um, it, it kind of depends on what science you want to do. So I'll talk a little bit about geology. Um, we'll take an image, and then we have to map it onto a surface map to understand where each of the pixels go. And then we can take two images, for example, and make a stereo image. So that's how I made the, the stereo, how we made the stereo images. And so we can get terrain and elevation from that. So it takes two images at two different viewing angles of the same surface to be combined to get the elevation. One of the science, some of the science that I really enjoy doing is infrared spectroscopy, where we have images of the surface over a large number of wavelengths at a very fine spacing to make a spectrum. And so for each surface element, you can see how much light you get from 1.2 microns to 2.5 microns in the infrared. And we get 256 spectral elements across that. And you can make a spectrum. And you can fit that spectrum to laboratory models of surface ices or surface molecules. And that's how I could stand up here with confidence and tell you that the glacier, the glacier was made of nitrogen ice and methane ice and carbon monoxide ice. Because those all have absorption bands in that region. And so we take those images and we make them into a cube so that each latitude and longitude slice I can get a spectrum out and then I model it. So, um, and the green? Yeah. So the Louder? You said that nitrogen makes up a lot of those atmosphere. What else makes up that? Yeah, so nitrogen is the predominant uh, molecule in Pluto's atmosphere. And that has to do with the vapor pressure equilibrium. Those of you guys taking chemistry or physics might you know phase diagrams. So uh, sorry, I know AP tests are coming, but this physics and chemistry is important. <laughs> and so uh, at the temperature and pressure of Pluto, you're going to get more nitrogen vapor above nitrogen ice than you do with methane and carbon monoxide. So the other things that make up the atmosphere are methane and carbon monoxide, but it's mainly nitrogen. Okay. Oh, I see. Sorry. Uh, let's see. The, uh, the guy right, the person right there? Uh, either one. Yeah, so engineering design process and how do we compensate for everything? So, that's a good question. So we did a lot of work in the proposal phase. We had to propose and compete against other teams to be the ones to fly this mission. There were other teams from other institutions that wanted to fly the Pluto. So we did a lot of work and NASA had goals. They wanted to understand the geology, the composition, the atmosphere. So we told them how we would do that. So we did a lot of the work early. And so we built prototype instruments. And we showed that we could use them on the ground, not flying them. Some of them had flown before. But. And then once we won, we really hit the ground. We use a lot of heritage. So systems that we've used before, flight systems that have used, guidance and control, what has worked, structures. We're not reinventing the wheel every time. We're taking what we know works and modifying what we need. One of the biggest issues was the guidance and control system, especially had to handshake to work well with the imaging instruments. One of our imaging instruments, the one I work on, is called the RALPH camera, and that's an AECOM acronym. And RALPH scans across a body to take an image. So the spacecraft has to scan, and then RALPH is reading out a line of the image the whole time. And that's how we made that great image at the very end. But the spacecraft has to scan very accurately. And the RALPH instrument has to communicate with the spacecraft to know exactly how it's scanning. And then for that 
image, we knew that depending on where Pluto was, it would have to scan at different rates. So we had to make a new way of communicating that rate change over time. And so really the design process was identify our goals, look at what we have and what can work, find out where the holes are, start working those.